to a special edition of the Parastyle Podcast on a Wednesday evening. We're doing this in the evening. I had a bunch of stuff going on during the day. I'm going to be heading over to Catalina, go fishing, camping for a couple of days. So, shock, I mean, not shotgun, Cotter <laughs> Morissette and I are squeezing this in Wednesday evening, kind of our tunnel vision time. But this is the Parastyle Podcast. This is the uh, Connor and Ryan show, the flagship show of the Parastyle Podcast, whatever you want to say. But I am... Uh, Ryan Abraham joined in studio by Connor Morissette, a.k.a. Triple Double. What's up, Connor? How are you doing, man? Doing well. Excited to be here. Excited to get into some of these transfers and some NIL stuff. Should be a great show. We got Yeah, we're going to talk. Uh, if you guys don't know, um, all those NCAA rules about NIL, they're gone. Uh, the courts say, nope, you can't do that. That's illegal. So we're going to talk about that if USC changes their approach uh, to how they uh, recruit using uh, name, image, and likeness money through their collectives and all that. And uh, we're going to rank sort of by where we think they could have the biggest impact, the 11 transfers coming in uh, for USC. So Connor going to kind of give you his thoughts on the uh, the top 11, where these guys, like how you think, you know, what order they're going to come in as far as impact on the 2024 season. If you guys have any questions or comments, uh, you can email us, podcast at uscfootball.com. You can also call or text us at 424-254-9141. We are live on YouTube, so if you're joining us there live, thank you so much. If you're in the chat and you have a question, just put question up front, and uh, I will start and get back to it later uh, when we answer questions. And if you have like a funny comment or something and I can see it while I'm doing my hosting duties, I would love to put it up on the screen and so everyone can see that you are funny and you are listening to the show or watching the show live. Uh, if you're listening to the podcast, you don't get to see those comments. My apologies. But we will talk about uh, any comments that come in, ask questions, and uh, all of that. If you have the Apple Podcasting app, we would love to get a five-star review and some sort of uh, uh, you know rating there. Five stars is always great. I think you can rate uh, the podcast on Spotify as well. Anywhere you can rate us. If you can subscribe to us, you can uh, like the feed, you can like the podcast, do all that stuff. Tell your friends, if you still go to the water cooler at your office and they're a USC fan there, getting, fill it up there, uh, Stanley mug, what are those things? Are those like the hot things now, the Stanley ones? Like everyone, those are really hot. I think hot. so. Yeah, I think they're the hot ones. Filling up your Stanley mug at the water cooler. You got a friend there that's a USC fan. Just tell them, tell them about the Parastyle Podcast. Hey, I'm going to go hear what Connor has to say about NIL. And ranking these transfers. So, uh, yeah, th thanks for being here. We appreciate you guys being uh, everyone that's here live or listening uh, wherever you are listening. We do appreciate Trader Joe's as well. Uh, Connor, I mentioned I'm heading over to Catalina. Uh, quick fishing and uh, camping, one night of camping over there. And I always go to the Trader Joe's and stock up all my stuff, anticipating that we're getting cat, we're catching stuff like halibut or whatever. So I buy this vegetable medley from Trader Joe's and uh, grab one of their lemons and some butter from over there. And, uh, you know, on a camp stove, I kind of melt the butter and get the, the uh, season up the veggies and, and cook them up there. So it's a really good side for the uh, the fish that we'll grill or, uh, or fry up there when we're over there. So a lot of good stuff over at Trader Joe's. And I, I think the last time I too, I bought, I got to, I still got to go there tonight um, by the, uh, Chocolate covered pretzels. That's a good snack for the boat on the way over there. So one of my favorites. I heard last time you went fishing, you had the hot hand. So hopefully that continues. I did. Yeah, that was it was good. Uh got a keeper halibut. I got the biggest leopard shark I've seen. It was a, like I held it up. It was to my nose. I mean, it was six <laughs> feet tall. So uh pretty cool. We throw those guys back, but we, you know, how the goal is halibut over twenty two inches. Those are the ones we can keep. So I got one of them, but it's good. You get every halibut you get like four fillets out of so it's just pretty good meal um so appreciate that a courtman says uh smash the like yeah please if you're watching live first of all thank you for watching live on youtube but smash that like button um i was uh i was in the desert on monday the uh i think it was a fourth annual so olive crest uh golf tournament olive crest is a charity it's in throughout Southern California and they, they work with foster kids trying to get them, you know, when they, you know, age out of the system, a lot of them end up homeless and all this stuff. So they really help these kids coming out of uh, foster care or if they need help in foster care. And Darnell Bing, Dr. Darnell Bing now, he's been on the, a guest on the show. 
Um, he's really involved with the charity and they got me involved. So I've been on the board, uh, the last couple of years, but we had a really good time. Um, I, this is, uh, this is my foursome, um, uh, Brandon Hancock, USC fans. You might remember him fullback for Matt Leinart and you know, blocking for Reggie Bush and Lindell White. And, uh, Sonny Bird was, uh, Pete Carroll's tailback. He scored the last touchdown in the uh, orange bowl against, uh, Iowa. And then, uh, Michael Hyde is there too, big USC fan and, he kind of sponsors our group, but we've been, been playing with these guys for a while. It's uh, It was a lot of fun. And there's a bunch of players that were there. So uh, Jalen McKenzie, who just graduated a couple of years ago, he's uh, with the the, the uh, Las Vegas Raiders now. He was there. Darnell Bing, uh, Jim Abbott, and then some other players. Juju Smith, Schuster came out. Um, it was cool to see him. Sua Cravens. Uh, they didn't stay afterwards for the dinner, but they, you know, so they weren't in that one picture I had. But fun group. It's always cool to get... Some of the, especially like the old USC football players, you know, the different generations, like having Jalen McKenzie there, like one of the young guys was cool. And then you got like guys like Sua and Juju and then, you know, older guys like Darnell Bing and Sonny Bird and stuff. So a lot of different generations of USC fans, but it was a lot of fun. We got to get you to play in that one, Connor. I need some lessons before uh, playing with that group, I think. No, I don't. Well, I, we did pretty good. Like our group, we finished tied for fourth. So it was, it was not bad, but, um, yeah, there's some. There's a couple of ringers that weren't there this year, so I oh, made dude. it a little bit easier. Yeah, it was a scramble. I think the winner was minus thirteen, um, and we were minus nine. So we were like in. Sometimes you you play in those things, and the guys like, oh, minus you know twenty. You're like, okay, so you birdied every hole and eagled a couple. Like, what? How is this possible? But um, yeah, we got a bunch of birdies. It was it was nice. It was a lot of fun. But anyway, okay, we got a fun show for you uh, today. Connor, I, it's, it's dealer's choice here. Would you like to talk transfers or would you like to talk NIL first? Where do you, where would you like to go with this one? Well, I feel like we've talked NIL a lot, and I think there might be more meat on the transfer draft bone that we're going to do. Okay. Do start there? Let's, let's start with the transfer uh, draft bone. I like that. Um, 11 mm -hmm. incoming transfers. So far, and that will change, obviously, with – the second window coming up after spring practice, but heading into this first spring practice season for USC, um, 11 transfers coming in, and yeah, so let's draft them. Yeah, it's going to change up a little bit. Um, you, people could still transfer in, but with the academic calendar, it just this isn't a transfer time. It's not. There's no window open to enter the portal, but there's a lot of players that are already in the portal. Um, but you know, you're not expecting to get any kind of commitments uh, at this point, but. You know, that can happen sort of down the road. Obviously, all those coaching changes happen, so more portal windows opened. But, you know, like when Jim Harbaugh left, uh, you know, Michigan was already, I believe, already in set, you know, class was in session. It was just been, it would have been tough to kind of transfer out at that point. But we expect the spring window with all the coaching changes and everything, there's probably going to be a lot of turnover. Guys get processed out, they go into the portal. But for now, like Connor said, there's 11. So should we start at the bottom? Go to the 11? Sure. Do you want me to start with the the 11th pick and then work? Yeah. Who's your 11th okay. pick of the transfer? And this is not that these could all be great. They could all be really good. But at this point, this is like what, and the caveat here is impact for 2024 season. You're bringing in a transfer. Some guys might be for the long haul. Some guys might be for specialty positions, whatever. But who's going to have the biggest impact on USC's first year in the Big Ten? Great. I love it. You spelled it out perfectly. Most impactful players. I just have a bias against long snappers with all due respect to <laughs> Hank Pepper. He will probably uh, come in and do really well because he was a scholarship guy at Michigan State taking over for Jack Cassante. He was out of eligibility, but he comes in at number 11 for me just because he's not one of those guys on offense or defense. And if, if he was a kicker, I'd, I'd probably give him some more love. But a long snapper, when they have 11 guys and 10 out of the 11 or more the traditional football players you yeah. think of when you when you think of recruiting and all that, I have to go with Pepper at number eleven. He's, what year? What year is he? He's, I think he only has one more year left. Yeah, so that, it's one thing if it was like a like a you know freshman or something. He had four. Like if you get a solid long snapper for four years, that's that like that's not impactful for the next year, but you know that can have an impact. Like having a you know it's one of those things where if you don't have it, it's a glaring weakness. And when you have it, you're just like you just kind of take it for granted, but. Yeah, he's a guy who, sorry to say, but you just take that position for granted. We were never talking about the long snapper last year until they had that screw-up against Arizona at the end of regulation. Yeah. So the only time 
we're talking about him is if something bad happens. To me, that means, of course, you can have an impact, but I'm just biased, I guess, against these uh, special teams players. So he comes in at number 11. Hope he has a great season. No mistakes. We won't be talking about him. That means things will be going well. But, yeah, I got him at number 11. Okay. Fair enough. What do you got at 10? Okay, yes. Now the uh, real analysis we can get into. So Jaden Richardson, the wide receiver from Tufts, the Division three to Division one jump he's making, that, to me, is really, really interesting, obviously. You just don't see that very much. And I'm just wondering what kind of a role he's going to play because I think coming in automatically, the really special group of sophomores next year, Zachariah Branch, Deuce Robinson, Makai Lemon, and Jacoby Lane, I feel like Richardson will just be behind them. And that fifth receiver spot, it could be him. It could be the freshman DJ Jordan out of Sierra Canyon. It's sort of up for grabs. And I think if you're the fifth receiver in Lincoln Riley's offense, that could be big. But in the grand scheme of things, if we're talking most impactful, I have him at number 10. Just a lot of questions with him making that jump from D3 to D1 and the guys ahead of him. Yeah, that I mean, that makes sense. We, You know, you bring in it, the receiver spot for this team. It can be a little kind of a mystery where a guy like Dorian Singer was really, really productive at Arizona and just was just sort of like someone that was, it was like a body at USC. And, you know, for whatever reason, if you, you know, you got to gel with the quarterback and all that kind of stuff. And he's not someone that gelled with Jaden Delora when he was at Arizona because Jaden Delora like punched him on the sidelines or whatever. So that was, that wasn't good, but it just didn't work. Well, they um, did kind of gel. I mean, he had a great season. Oh yeah. Him. No, but I mean, the, I would say the chemistry between yeah. the two wasn't great, <laughs> of all, even though he was the second leading receiver in the Pac-12. Um, but someone like this could come in, you know, and, and, and have a bigger impact than you think. Like, mm-hmm. I don't know if Taj, people thought Taj Washington was going to be the end all you know, coming over from Memphis and just was really, really productive. So he could be the guy, like if he's the fifth receiver, but like very productive, picks up a bunch of third downs, you know, like whatever it is, like, okay, you know, you could see that. But I, you know, I think I would agree with you in this one that, you know, it's, it's not one that you're like expecting a guy from Tufts to come in and crush it, but. You know, there's that potential there. Mm-hmm. And if he comes in and does great, that's amazing. But if he doesn't do as well, and it is like a Dorian Singer situation, with Dorian Singer, he had this track record of, hey, I was so great last year. You need to keep giving me chances. And I feel like based on his track record, those were deserved. If Jaden Richardson doesn't come out and take his opportunity early. He's and not he, going to get Exactly. That. And he gets buried. It's like, okay, you're from Tufts. <laughs> we're, we're, you're kind of lucky to be here in the first place. And that sounds harsh, but you know what I mean? Like, it's just different when you come from Tufts and if it doesn't go well, I could see another guy overstepping him and probably overstepping him for the long haul. I think since we're both from, you know, Massachusetts, we maybe we're biased against Tufts. Like Tufts, like, no, the, who comes out of Tufts? Like that's what, people don't even know what that is, but like, yeah, it's the, like, if you go the to Nescac, New England, baby, yeah. New, is that what it is? That's their league. Um, yeah. If you're in like New England, you can basically, you know, every town has a college in it. So it's just, they're, they're everywhere. Uh, but Tufts a good one. It's just mm-hmm. not really known for football. <laughs> no. At number nine, this might be my first semi-controversial one. I just think he's going to be the backup quarterback, and it's tough to have a huge impact when you're the backup quarterback. So Jaden Maeva comes in Whoa. at number nine for me. I know some other people have done lists, and he's been higher. It's like, Ryan, when we do the top 50 most impactful or top 25 most impactful Trojans before the football season, and Miller Moss, he's always way higher on the, the big list than he is on my list, at least over the past uh, year because when you're the backup, you don't play. And to have an impact, of course, you can help in practice. But I you, was with you. I didn't have Miller yeah, Moss high at all. You, like you need those. to be on the field. And at quarterback, there's only one guy who's going to take the majority of the reps, obviously. We'll see. If he comes out and wins the job, then he skyrockets to number one because he's the quarterback, and that will be obvious. But to me, if he's a backup and he's not going to play at all unless there's an injury, I don't know how you can have him very high. No, I, I agree with you there. Now, the, the thing is, you know, Lincoln Riley says he has a chance to win the job. So uh-huh. we're kind of anticipating that Miller Moss is going to win the job, but we could be wrong. I've you know, been wrong before. So, but yeah, so I, I, I kind of agree with you there. If he's going to be the backup quarterback, he's just not going to have as much of an impact. I mean, you could argue that the long snapper would be, have more of an impact if he's the backup there, but you know, everyone's one play away from getting in and you know, he would be, there's not a lot of depth at the quarterback spot. So he, there's importance there. It's quarterback, but uh, as the backup, yeah, I'd probably not be as impactful for 2024 as some of these other guys. There's importance, too, with chemistry. I think Maeva, he doesn't transfer to USC unless he thinks he can win the job. So, say it doesn't work out in that first year, then it's very important for him to be a good teammate and not 
cause a stink. He also transferred from UNLV, if people uh, tuning in didn't know that. So, and, and he has more experience than, than Miller Moss, which, which is interesting. But I just think Moss's two years in the Lincoln-Riley system, what he did in the bowl game, being yeah. that consummate professional, a guy everyone beloves at USC, it's going to be tough to overtake him. Maeva has a shot, like Lincoln Riley said. I don't know, as of February 28th, I see him winning the job. But hey, never say never. Yeah, Miller Moss has, you know, got the locker room right. Like yeah. he, it was, uh, you know, he's what he did in the bowl game, and even before that, you know, it's just one of those things where he's a popular player, and it would be hard for Maeva to come in and uh, kind of take that over. But yeah, we'll see. At number eight, I have DeCarlos Nicholson, the cornerback transfer from Mississippi State. And to me, it just comes down to my depth chart on February 28th. I feel like John Humphrey is probably going to start the UCLA transfer at boundary corner. And then if he can stay healthy, Jacoby Covington, I think, is that other starting corner. So right away, DeCarlos Nicholson doesn't slot in as a starter. And I think the rest of the guys on my list have a chance to start. So that's why he comes in at eight. Again, it's February 28th. A lot can change. He's six foot three, 195 pounds. Jacoby Covington is an injury risk. Who knows if John Humphrey will, will get beat out or not. I think he'll probably get a starting job because he's so familiar with Danton Lynn. The DeCarlos Nicholson thing, why I have him low is just I don't think he's a guaranteed starter. And some of these other guys aren't. He, the, the, the way for him to get on the field might be a little bit tougher than, than some of these other players. So I have him a little bit lower. I feel like he's the number three cornerback right now on the roster. Obviously, a lot can change. Right. Still, number three cornerback probably playing a bunch. You know, how they construct – the secondary um, with the nickel and the state, I mean, it, it could look a lot different than what we've seen uh, in years past. So he's going to have to come in and, you know, beat out some guys. So it'll be fun to kind of see what he does in the spring and see, you know, compare him to a Jacoby Covington who's been around for a couple of years and was very promising when he was at Washington and then, you know, did some really good things. Just couldn't stay on the field. Thing. Yeah, it was tough. Whenever he did get on the field, he, he was awesome against Arizona. He had a pick. In the bowl game, he was great. He just missed a lot of time. Yeah. And I think, to Prophet Brown, he's sort of a unknown in this whole cornerback equation, had the great bowl game, was always sort of viewed as a depth piece. Has he taken a jump after the bowl game, and could he push for a starting job? I didn't even mention him earlier. He maybe could be that number three cornerback right now. I don't see it that way. That could change. And then Marcellus Williams, he has all the potential in the world. If he's ahead of schedule, maybe – he pushes for a starting job potentially as a true freshman or even that number three corner spot. So DeCarlos Nicholson has a lot of experience, but I still think he needs to work really hard to get on the field. I like his name, too. Yeah, they have a lot of great names. There's a, yeah, DeCarlos Nicholson's just like, that's pretty badass. <laughs> I love it. Number seven, yes. I have safety Akili Arnold from oh, Oregon okay. State. And he's similar to Nicholson for me, but I can see him getting on the field. His path, I think it's a little bit easier if you just break down the, the depth chart. So, spoiler alert, we're going to talk about Kamari Ramsey later. I think he's locked in as a safety starter. And then the second guy next to him is somewhat up in the air. If Jalen Smith, who did such a nice job as a free safety in the bowl game, gets switched from nickel to, to safety, then it, there's an opening at nickel. I think Akili Arnold could play nickel for USC. So that's something that I see as a path for playing time with him. If he is going to stay at safety, he'll probably fight for a spot alongside Kamari Ramsey. And then there's just a lot of bodies there. He'll be competing with Zion Branch, Anthony Beavers, Bryson Shaw. You might like Akili Arnold better than those three guys, but I think Zion Branch, you can't really overlook him right now. He came on really strong last year before getting hurt, and his injury wasn't too serious. It was serious enough to end his season, but he will be back and fully healthy, ready to go this spring, I believe. So they'll be competing. I think that's a fascinating competition. I think Arnold's a little bit more versatile than Nicholson because he can play that nickel spot, and I think he'll have an easier time getting on the field. I could see him rotating in at safety if he doesn't get a starting job, whereas the two boundary corners, you're probably just riding with those two for the most part. We'll see. February 28th, a lot up in the air, but uh, what do you think there, Ryan? Do you think Achille Arnold could break in? I, I think he has a great chance to start, but he's going to get pushed. Yeah, I think he'll get pushed. I really, just the secondary as a whole, um, even last year, there was a lot of, there was a lot of pieces. There was a lot of potential. It's, and some guys shine, but it just, you know, when the defense is that bad, it's really hard for anybody to be good. You're Now I feel like there's a bunch of, you know, potential starters there, there's a lot of bodies there that guys that you could see being you know big 10 starters uh and you're just not sure maybe they're third on the depth chart or maybe they're a starter we, you just don't know yet 
but you have good coaching to go along with it and you feel like they're going to be put in good positions that someone's going to you know rise to the top that you maybe you didn't expect so i, I feel like these all all these guys are gonna have a better opportunity put in better spots and you know a guy like arnold i think he's been very productive in college i mean that helps when you come in familiar with you know football here on the west coast um but you know he you know he seen ucla and you know denton lens obviously coming from there brought a couple guys with him um, so, I'm, yeah, I'm curious to see how this kind of all shakes out. Like, this is – some spots, there's just not – like, you know, we talked about the quarterback spot. There's just not a lot of people there. There's not a lot of options. Like, there's only a couple roads you can go. And I feel in the secondary, all through this, there's a lot of different options. And like you said, like, oh, does Jalen Smith going from uh, nickel to free safety? Does that put Arnold at, at, at nickel? Or who's going to – you know, maybe it's someone that comes out of the blue or – Marcellus Williams or something comes in and like takes one of those spots and then moves everyone else around. I feel like there's, there's options and there's people who can get moved around and maybe it's even like a, a musical chairs thing where you're trying to figure out, you know, where, where am I going to go? It's like someone locks down, oh, if someone locks down the nickel that you didn't expect, then kind of maybe pushes other people around too. So long answer there, but yeah, I think there's a lot of options in the secondary. I also, like I said on the last show, the one we did with Chris, so two shows ago, actually, I think the secondary is going to be the best part of the defense. That's the unit I feel the best about right now between Danton Lynn coming in and his experience as a secondary coach in the NFL, but him bringing two guys from UCLA. You have some solid returning players there, even though you were killed at the cornerback spot in the transfer portal. I, I really like what they're doing there, and it all depends if you can get pressure on the quarterback because it's tough to play defensive back if you you got to cover a guy for a long period of time <laughs> if they're not getting pressure that'll change things yeah I, I think the secondary is gonna put a band-aid over some of the limitations though on this defense heading into next season and i i really believe it's going to be a, a very very good unit because i like what danton lynn's done and i just like a lot of these guys that's a lot of talent yeah for sure number six i have nate clifton the defensive lineman transfer from Vanderbilt. He had seven and a half tackles for loss and five and a half sacks last season. Only Jamil Muhammad and Solomon Bird matched that on USC. So right away, he's someone who's produced in the SEC, who has a good track record. I think he'll be in the rotation for sure. Good chance he starts. But who else has experience and that kind of production and that kind of versatility? Because he can play on either spot on the line. I'd, I'd say no one when you throw in versatility to the experience and the production. Bear Alexander comes to mind, and Jamil Muhammad, of course, will be back. But I think Clifton is a versatile piece, and sometimes we'll see him on the edge, sometimes we'll see him on the inside. I predict he'll start on the edge. That's where I see him beginning the season and beginning games. I, I think he'll be in that starting rotation. But for me, I just think he has that production and that talent that USC, they don't have a lot of proven commodities on their defensive line. He's one. He should play a lot. No, I agree with you there. Uh, love the versatility. Um, if you're productive in the SEC, especially at a team that's Snakes. not very good. <laughs> um, but could he be like the Jamil Muhammad kind of guy that came in and just just did a lot of things, You know, helped this defense in a lot of different ways? He's going to be very impactful if he's starting on the edge uh, for this USC defense. So I think... I think you needed guys that are, you know, smart, productive, um, good teammates. He just seems like he's all those things and will fit into whatever Danton Lynn uh, and the coaching staff kind of wants him to do. So, yeah, I, th I think he can be a, you know, if he started on the edge, he's, he's very impactful, maybe higher than even what you have him here. I think the ideal situation is Isaiah Rakes plays a lot of nose tackle and then that frees up Barry Alexander to play defensive tackle. Whereas if Nate Clifton is in there and Rakes isn't, I think then you'd have to have Bear play the nose, nose which yeah. he did last year a lot. I, I don't think that was exactly what USC envisioned him doing, but he kind of had to because they just didn't get enough production from other players. So I still think USC is really, really thin on the defensive line. Yeah. They have some guys with great potential, but you just got to see it before you can say they're in a good spot. And I think Clifton has a great chance to help him out. I'm just so fascinated. I think out of all the guys who we've talked about so far and all the newcomers, I want to know where USC and Danton Lynn thinks his best spot is because he said last year I played on the inside, but the or, or I forget where, but last year he played one specific spot, but the previous years he played the other. He can do whatever the coaches need him to do. I want to know where they think he's best. I agree with you. 
Let me flip the page here. Oh, get nice. To top you're, five. Wait, you have actual like paper? Yes, I, I like to do notes by hand. That's great. Like that's <laughs> especially someone your age. That doesn't happen, you know. Like it, it, when I write stuff out, it helps me more than when I type it out. I, I don't know. Maybe because I'm a lefty. I don't know. Oh, <laughs> you you. Oh yeah, you played golf, lefty, right? Yep, yeah, not very well, but yep. No, I remember. Yeah, because we had to like set up. We we did a simulator. It was <laughs> yeah, like, and I screwed it all up. <laughs> well, it's like, oh, we got a lefty. That's fine. Okay, the the top five. Without further ado, here. So John Humphrey is number five for me. Following Danton Lynn, he's a cornerback at UCLA last year, six foot, 205 pounds, 31 tackles, two picks, three pass breakups. He's going to have competition. I think, though, you have to pencil him in as one of those starters because he's following the defensive coordinator and he started last season. Jacoby Covington staying healthy. Like I said before, I think those two are your starters, but is Prophet Brown a viable option to Carlos Nicholson? Where does he fit in? I just think the experience with Danton Lynn is the big leg up that John Humphrey has over everyone else in the room, and that to me means he'll be an impact player because he has a year under his belt with USC's new DC. Yeah, I, I think you look at UCLA's defense last year, significantly better than USC's. He was a starter. You bring over the coach, he's going to start for USC. Like I, I mean, it would be shocking if he's not one of the starters to me. Maybe that's too simple of analysis, but it just seems like that's where you're kind of going with this. Like when you when you come over, uh, you know, Denton Lynn was only a defensive coordinator for one year. You get some, you, you kind of need some security blankets and stuff. You know, your quarterback has your tight end or whatever. Like if you're bringing over a couple of your dudes when you for your new job, those are guys you're going to probably rely on a lot. You know, you know, what's the tone in the locker room? Like you it. Something I think would have to go seriously wrong if if those guys aren't starting. So I, I would agree with you, high impact for sure. Mm -hmm. That's that's how I see it. Number four. So this is a guy who's high on some people who've done these lists and, and low on some other people who's done them. If you follow other USC writers who have put out lists like this, I know Chris did one and he's really high on Isaiah Rakes and I am too. I have him at four, the defensive lineman transfer from Texas A and M. But I understand why some people would have him lower because he was only a rotation piece. Last year for the Aggies, he started a handful of games earlier in his career, didn't start as many last season, 17 tackles, three tackles for loss. He just didn't get a ton of time, and he was a highly rated recruit. Played enough, though, to, to obviously warrant a transfer to USC, and I do think there's a massive need there, of course, so I, I see him playing a lot. My one concern is it's a new coaching staff, but I thought Keon Bars was going to come in and it was going to be Bear and, and Keon Bars and problem solved on the inside of the defensive line. That of course, didn't end up happening. So the defensive line, it's just so much rotation there. So maybe he plays fewer snaps than some of the guys lower on the list. But I think from an impact perspective, he's another proven commodity, even though he doesn't have a ton of time under his belt last season. I, I still think he's way more experienced than the guy like Elijah Hughes at USC, who you're relying on, I think, to be in the rotation again. And he has a lot of upside, but you'd take rakes, I think, if it's like a fourth and one game on the line over Elijah Hughes right now. And to me, he's just something that USC desperately needed. And I feel burned for, by Keon Bars last season. So I, I'm kind of going back and forth. I'm a little conflicted about having him at four. I, I just don't see how he doesn't play a lot at six foot two, 320 pounds. No. And Lincoln Riley saying, we need to be bigger. We need to be bigger. This is the biggest guy you have now. He's a big dude. I, that picture, I'll put the picture up again if you guys didn't get If you're watching on YouTube, I mean, a massive human being. You need this. You need these kind of guys. And. I thought Keon Bars would have a bigger impact. Yeah. If if Keon Bars was transferring in this year and he had Denton Lynn and that staff, I think they he would have had a bigger impact. Like it was just one of those guys coming in the transfer, not productive defense. It just it just didn't work out. Um, so I I'm higher on this one here. I think you know four three. I mean I, I yeah I would definitely have him in the top four. It's such a position of need, and you feel like. You know, Bear Alexander was a rotational guy and comes in and didn't put up big numbers, but was very impactful in what he, you know, brought to the table and helped the rest of the defense. And I think you could see the same thing here with Rake. So, I, yeah, I've, I, I agree with you on this one. I'm just concerned that if it, if it doesn't work out, it's like, oh, you know, we saw this last year. I, I hope it's different. The staff is, of course, different. So we, we got to take that. Uh, when we're talking about this. So, okay, top three. I, I feel like Real there's... Real quick, a, Logan oh, said, uh, Rakes clogs the middle, allowing Bear to get the penetration and sacks slash TFLs. I yeah, ideally. That's uh, 
that's how it should look. I, I think that's what, what they're looking for. That's how they see it. And, I mean, it looks good on February 28th. I keep saying today's date because so much time has to go by before we see it on we the We got field. leap year tomorrow. Oh, yeah. Any that's leap true. year birthdays out there in the chat? Let us know. <laughs> um, happy, uh, you're probably like 12 years old or something if it's your birthday on leap year, right? <laughs> so, yeah. Nice. Into the top three. Yes. And I have a big squiggly line here on my notes because I feel like there's a pretty good top three and then there's somewhat of a gap. I start at number three, Easton Mascarenas Arnold, the linebacker transfer from Oregon State. I think you pencil him in as a starter. He'll come in. He should have a big impact. He is up and down a little bit. If you look at PFF grades, you don't want to live and die by those. He would have had the best rating out of all the linebackers on USC's team from last season, but that's because the USC linebackers – were so bad. He was all Pac-12 first team last season, 107 tackles. I just feel like he was brought in to fill a void. He'll start, and I hope that the weakness that really plagued USC's defense last year, their linebackers, by adding Easton Mascarenas Arnold and bringing back a bunch of those other guys, it's just going to get better with some new coaches. So that's the hope there. Some people have him at one in some other list. I have him at three, and I can explain why in these other two guys coming up. I, yeah, I'm I'm good with this too. Uh, looking for years, um, USC's defense. Yeah. And like I remember when like Todd Orlando was was brought in, he was a linebackers guy. You know, like Grinch was a secondary dude. Um, Orlando was a linebackers guy, and I thought, you know what, he's going to be the coach that elevates the play of the linebacker, so they actually produce and do something on the field instead of just sort of, you know, be around and you know get a tackle every once in a while, like. Linebackers are supposed to be like forcing the action places, you know, blowing things up. And it just seemed like for USC's defense, it didn't matter who the defensive coordinator is. Like just for the last several years, they were not a productive position. You know, the leading tackler would be like the nickelback or a safety or something. And, um, you know, every once in a while, a linebacker would have a good game, but not that consistent. Like where a guy like Arnold, who's first team, you know, all, uh, all pack 12 and, I think he led the team and tell you over a hundred tackles. Like you want dudes like that. Um, and you got a dude like that. So that's great. Mason Cobb was kind of like that guy and seemed to kind of fall into some of the USC, you know, whatever bad, bad juju at linebacker. So we'll see if that can, if you can overcome that, but you want those productive players in there at that linebacker spot and you, the better coaching you're hoping, I mean, you got to, national championship winning head coach to coach the linebackers. Now you better be damn productive in that position. They just haven't been for years. So looking for some kind of improvement here and then getting a guy like that, a proven proven contributor is a big deal. And I see Mascarenas Arnold as being a solid linebacker. I think his ceiling, that's sort of what it is. In my opinion, I don't think he's going to be a superstar on defense or like this other guy we're going to talk about in a second, a superstar on offense. The top two guys on my list I really do think have superstar potential, and that's why I have them in my top two. I think Mascarene, it's Arnold. He was first team all Pac-12 last season. Some people listening to this will be like, well, what more do you want from the guy? I, I think statistically he, he was reliable, made a lot of tackles, good player. I wonder if Mason Cobb maybe could be better than, than Easton Mascarene, Arnold. Could he make a big jump with better coaches and a better guy al alongside him? I, I wonder just if Mason Cobb maybe has the tools to to put together a better season. And I, I don't want to make this sound like I'm negatively arguing for, for, for Easton. He's the number three most important transfer on my list. I, I just feel like he's going to be solid. And I, I wonder if uh, there are some other guys around him who might be even better. Yeah. All right. Who's your top two? Okay. Number two, Jaquavius Marks, the running back Oops, from sorry, I put the wrong picture up there. Mississippi State. I thought last year Marshawn Lloyd was the second most important transfer to USC behind Bear Alexander, and I think Jaquavius Marks, he'll have even less competition at the running back spot unless USC takes another transfer in the second window. He's the guy. He will have first-team reps the second he gets on campus. He can run the ball. He can catch the ball. He, he's a proven dual-thread option in that regard. If you look at his stats at Mississippi State, he, he's great out of the backfield catching the ball. I think... In a Lincoln Riley coached offense with his size, he, he's big. He's a 
He's he's a brute. He can he can run over people. I I, I think he's somewhat similar to, to Marshawn Lloyd in, in that area, and maybe even a little bit better as a receiver. So I I think his potential is very high in this offense with USC. He just needs to stay healthy because they don't have a lot of pieces behind him. I think he really does have superstar potential in this offense, kind of like Marshawn Lloyd last season. If Lloyd cleaned up the fumbles, he that was really the only knock against him, that and some pass protection. But he, he was electric. He's going to be a high draft pick, probably third round, maybe even the second coming up. I could see Marks having a, a similar trajectory with a great season at USC. Yeah, I think there's uh, the sky's the limit, I think, for Marks. And, you know, what, what happened in Lincoln Riley's first year? Like, Travis Dye comes in you know, before he got hurt, but was a team leader. Instantly, you know, was incorporated into everything and was very productive. Austin Jones, same way, coming in from Stanford, two transfer running backs. Um, you know, last year, you know, outside of the fumbles, Marshawn Lloyd, I mean, uh, you know, he, people are saying really good things about him. And uh, he'll be at the Combine, I believe, right? He's going to be one of the guys, mm -hmm. um, you know, going to get drafted and uh, had a good year for USC there. And then. Um, you think Marks can kind of, you know, follow those footsteps and and do this do the same. So, a lot of production there. If you if you can be a starting running back, you're going to be a very impactful player, uh, especially this Lincoln Riley offense. Especially when you can catch the ball. So yeah, I get him being number two makes sense to me. It's a bunch of young guys behind him. Last season you had Austin Jones there too, who picked up the slack when Lloyd couldn't play and had a really solid season. I'm going to be interested to see who the number two running back is coming out of camp in the spring because is it Quentin Joyner who played a little bit early on, but then got buried after fumbling late against Notre Dame. They just don't have a lot of experience. A, a Marion Peterson's behind him. And then a, a, a true freshman, uh, Brian Jackson is behind those guys. So I, I think they need to take another running back at some point. I'd be surprised if they didn't. We'll see. Of course they need to find a new running back coach right now. It just seems to me, yeah. Ryan, like Marks, he he's so obviously the starter and, and that, when, when you're going to have that much of an opportunity and you have the talent that he has, I, I think he really has the potential to do something special. Agree with you there. And I think by process of elimination, I know who your number one is. <laughs> yes, because I mentioned him earlier. So <laughs> Kamari Ramsey, the safety, is, is my number one. And I just think he's a damn good football player. And when we heard Danton Lynn, when he we heard him in person for the first time when he spoke a couple weeks ago with the other assistants, he said there were guys who, when I installed our defense, really got it and really – went with it and ran and just got better and maybe were even better than I expected. And then there were guys who didn't get it, and I was surprised by that. He didn't mention anyone by name, but I think Kamari Ramsey, that's a guy who, when Danton Lynn came in, he got so much better. He was a red shirt the year before, didn't play at all. Danton Lynn comes in, and he was a stalwart in that secondary for UCLA. I think he has NFL potential. I think he's really just scratching the surface. He's going to go into a second year of playing college football he has the experience with Danton Lynn from, from last season. He's a great kid off the field. You can trust him. He's a guy I wanted USC to get out of high school. Instead, he, of course, went to UCLA. I just think at the back end of the defense, Kalen Bullock was sort of boom or bust, and I think Kamari Ramsey, he might not have the, the boom plays that Kalen Bullock has, but he's so consistent back there. Only four missed tackles last season. I just think the world of him, and I think he has the potential to be the most impactful transfer, so I got him number one. No, oh, I like that. Um, I mean, USC obviously needs the most help on the defensive side of the ball. Um, you're coming in. You already improved when Denton Lynn came in, and uh, you're going to be, you know, his dude coming over here. So one of those security blankets that you could just come in and and rely on. So I could see him playing a major, major role uh, in this reworked USC defense. So uh, I'm good with your. I, I like your top eleven. It's, uh, it works for me. You thank know? you. Thank you. And I'll tell Chris his stinks. You know? <laughs> when Jaden Maeva starts and the, and the long snapper wins the Heisman, you can email me. Right. Then you're like, oh, Connor, <laughs> so terrible at this. Uh, good stuff. All right. Um, well, if you have any questions in the chat on any of that, I know there have been some comments. I've tried to put them up. I did see a, as a, we a go. few questions. Did you see the one about the defensive line? Yeah, I, I starred those. Okay. We could, I, I mean, we could do them now if you wanted. Like, I don't mind. Like, there was a. Uh, I don't want to mess up your mojo though. It's your it's your show. Do you want to? Um, what would you put yeah, here I'll put because we were just talking about it, so I'll put I'll put that up right now. Um, this question is a live in the chat from Kevin. Another question with Connor saying that the defensive line is thin. Do you expect the freshman to play a lot? 
I don't know about a lot, but I, I think they have a chance. And, and especially on the inside of the, the defensive line, that's sort of where I think you have the most question marks. So you have Bear, obviously, Isaiah Rakes, who we've talked about, and then Clifton, he could play there, might not. Carlin Jones is a guy, to me, who he was down to USC and Ohio State. He picks USC late in the process, fairly highly rated guy. I don't believe he's an early enrollee. I think Chris was saying that. If he is and I'm wrong, please correct me in the chat. So that might hurt him. But I just think from a raw ability standpoint and from a size standpoint, he should have a chance to play because USC doesn't have a lot of bodies in the middle. Elijah Hughes will be a second-year guy next season, and he's someone I could see playing a little bit. Yeah. Dijon Lafitte was injured for most of this year, and he hasn't really gotten a chance. I, I don't know what his role will be just because he's such an unknown. So I, I look at Elijah Hughes as a young guy, and then Carlin Jones, I, I think, especially if there's an injury to one of these guys, he, he could be playing a big role. They need another body in the middle, in my opinion, for me to feel a little bit better about it because it's just really thin. That When I was talking about how, how thin the defensive line was, that's what I was referring to. I think on the end, it's a little thin too, but you, you have more bodies and, and more guys that you trust. Braylon Shelby, I think, is going to take a step forward. You want to see that before you can just say if that's going to happen for sure. Clifton, I do think, like I said earlier, will be on the edge, and then Jamil Muhammad comes back. You have Anthony Lucas, Sam Green, Devin Tompkins, who's sort of been buried a little bit, some, some freshmen. Cameron Fountain, I, I think, out of all the freshmen, he, he could play a lot too. So I, I like the edge group a little bit better, and I'm – I'm still a little concerned there, but I, I, I like that group better. I'm really concerned about the inside of the defensive line. One injury, I think you might be in trouble. Uh, maybe Jason's a little behind on the feed or something. He just put a comment in. Tufts? Wow. So maybe he's not watching <laughs> like quite live. Yep. USC got a guy from Tufts, um, which is very interesting. Uh, and we had uh, Fred, the veteran, if you're a uh, – Veteran of the Armed Services, thank you for your service. Um, Ramsey's going to be a beast. Yeah. That's I how I that, see it, too. Yeah, I think it's uh, definitely going to be Just that. solid. Just a solid, solid football player who I think has the ability to take another step. For sure. All right. Well, why don't we do this? Let's take a quick break, and we're going to come back. And uh, if you're watching on YouTube, it really won't be much of a break. But this is for our podcast audience. Take a quick break and come back, and we're going to talk about the uh, – the, the lack of NIL rules now and the wild, wild west becomes wilder. But we'll be back uh, in a minute. All right. We're back here on the Peristyle podcast. And I uh, hope you guys enjoyed the first half of the show breaking down the uh, incoming transfers and looking at the, each of their impact and potential impact on the team in 2024, the first season in the big 10, which is exciting. Um, we got to talk a little bit about NIL now because um, this off season has been, we're talking about impact, the most impactful one in college football history, you could argue. I mean, there's been so many things that have happened um, this offseason. It just things are – it's crazy. Like, changing the sport as we know it. I mean, there were things like, you know, the GOAT, Nick Saban retiring, and the, the, the ripple effect that had throughout college football where, you know, it – at the very end of it, like Bill O'Brien leaves Ohio State to be the head coach at Boston College and Chip Kelly leaves UCLA to become the offensive coordinator for his former quarterback, Ryan Day, at Ohio State. Like stuff that all that stuff happened because of like Nick Saban leaving. And then, you know, Jim Harbaugh uh, go, you know, winning the national championship at Michigan and going um, to the NFL, going back to the NFL, like stuff like that. Those would be the biggest stories like of any offseason. And they're like big, but not even like the biggest things that have been going on. I mean, the fact that unlimited transfers was okay. Well, now you can transfer out, and and that's happening. Okay, that's just you can transfer whenever you want. There's nothing we can do. And this latest one um, with the court ruling. I mean, there's been a lot of losses in court for the NCAA, and it basically has just taken away 
most of their, you know, power as far as what they could do. And we need to talk about, you know, in the NIL space where as soon as the NCAA didn't even release the notice of allegations, but they, um, you know, it was leaked or whatever. And they were, you know, usually the school gets notified, but nothing was officially released. Tennessee was ready and North Carolina and ten was it Virginia, North or Virginia and Tennessee, the attorney generals for those states. Attorneys general. Isn't that so stupid? Attorneys general. That, that's the plural. Okay. Attorneys general. That, it, that always bothers me whenever I read it. It should be attorney generals. I know that's wrong, but that just sounds way better. Yeah. Attorneys general uh, for those <laughs> two states. Um, they were ready and uh, oh, yeah. lost the first, like, what was it? The pre like preliminary, I forget what it was, the first one. But the, the latest ruling was just an absolute crushing blow for the NCAA. Now, yeah, it was a court somewhere in Tennessee. But essentially, what Tennessee was saying was, hey, we didn't break any rules. But the rules you think, you think we broke are not real. Anyway, those aren't legal. And th what it boils down to is, for years and years and years, I mean, the NCAA, I think originally the NCAA was to protect student athletes because there wasn't any kind of guidelines and, and college football players were like dying, right? Like there was like, this is 75, 80, whatever, long time ago. And then, but it, then it became like the institution to protect amateurism, which in the beginning when sport, the sport wasn't making a lot of money. It was fine, you know. Um, things changed. What was it like 84? I think it was the Oklahoma ruling that they would allow, like you could sell your TV rights and then the, the conferences were able to control television and instead of one game being on a week, like, you know, everyone's on national TV every day, you know, every game now. So things have changed. Obviously, the revenue dollars have changed. You're going from, you know, making hundreds of thousands of dollars maybe to millions to billions now and it just became to the point where the amateurism thing where universities get tax exempt status and they don't have to pay the players they can get free room and board and all that stuff the NCAA fought forever to keep that model and the Alston case was what you know pretty much a death blow if you're going to the Supreme Court and you lose nine to nothing. And the, you know, I think it was Justice Kavanaugh who wrote the opinion that was basically like, yeah, this isn't going to work. And if I ever see you guys back here again, I'm going to like ruin your whole, like your whole model's dead. Like your model is illegal. And that's what the courts just recently said is that you cannot limit the, you know, it's the antitrust laws come in where you can't say a student athlete can't make this money. So if it's coming from the collective, uh, if boosters are involved, the NCAA had all these rules, you couldn't, you know, uh, it can't be an inducement. Anything that would prevent them from earning a living, it's going into the antitrust laws. And then the, the courts are saying you can't do that. So pretty much everything the NCAA, all those rules, everything that they were trying to protect was all about amateurism. And like that's just been ripped up. Any sort of NCAA rule about NIL is gone. Like boosters can be involved. You can, uh, you know, USC is one of those schools that was kind of following the rules more than other people. Um, you know, if you want to have a student athlete come to campus and talk to your collective and say, we can get you a deal here and do this, all that stuff is legal now. Like it, you, there's no rules against it from the NCAA, even though there, you know, there was kind of this, these vague rules before. So the courts really just kind of took away everything. You know, I, I'm not sure what's left, like for a compliance department to do in a university, because you're basically learning all these rules and following them, and the courts just keep shutting them down. And so it was pretty wild. Um, I know it's a long kind of uh, ramble in there. I don't know if you disagree or agree with anything I said there, Connor, but I'll let you I'll give you the floor about this crazy. Yeah, but basically, like society has all these rules. And you just know that the rules, okay, like, hey, the rules are there. And the, now they're gone. You're like, oh, you do whatever you want. It's like the purge or something. Like, I don't know, everything, everything goes. Go murder, do whatever you want. There's no rules when it comes to NIL payments. So if, you know, that big Miami booster wants to just 
you know, put a post on Instagram of him handing out like a million dollar check to the player. Like, yep, you can do that. Like there's, there's nothing you can do to stop it from the NCAA side. Well, I've been banging the NIL drum for a while after national signing day. I wrote the column about how Oregon was just cleaning up against USC in, in recruiting and how NIL had to do with it somewhat, but it also had to do with just recruiting in general. And I felt like their staff those guys are dogs, and those guys grind on the recruiting trail. So it was a combination, and of course, the money helped. I just feel like, Ryan, in, in this era, and, and you want to compete for national championships, USC has the rock star head coach now in Lincoln Riley, but other schools have rock star head coaches too. And you need to find ways that you have an advantage over other schools and just do the best job you can in, in every facet of college football to, to get to the top. And I just don't know from an NIL perspective if – if USC really did that, and I don't exactly know who to point the, the finger at because I think it's a it's a group of people, but we had Jen Cohen in here, and I asked her about how, hey, Texas and Ohio State, they've signed people from, I think, the agency WME to help facilitate deals, and she said, oh, well, you know, that's technically against the rules. We're, we're not going to do that, and I felt like that was an example of pushing the envelope where by the letter of the law that might have been against the rules, but how those schools interpreted the rules were different than how USC interpreted yeah. the rules. And I think that USC, I understand why they wanted to interpret the rules the way they did and be cautious, but they, they lost a lot of ground by being cautious. And yeah. I, I think you look at the, the 2024 recruiting class, number 20 overall in the 247 sports rankings, it's a fine class at number 20, but – you, you want to shoot for better, and I wonder if USC, if they interpreted some rules differently, which now we know nothing would have happened had they done that, could they have had a better class? I, I think the obvious answer is yes, if they started to do things a little bit differently before. I'm not going to kill them for it, but I, I think when you're trying to be the best, you, you have to do things that maybe make you a little bit uncomfortable sometimes and shoot for the stars, and the school is risk-averse. I understand what's happened in the past. It's just different when you're competing against Ohio State against Texas, against Alabama, against Georgia, Oregon, Oregon yeah. a great example. You need to play the game, and USC just hasn't been doing that. Yeah, and you know, it's just one of those things where – and it was great to have Jen Cohen in here, and I think they're really sharp. And I think the – you know, you get different leadership and, and the mindset starts to change, but there's still, like, kind of this collective mindset around the campus and about, like – making sure you follow the rules, been in trouble before. And that's, I think it takes a little bit to kind of break out of that, but the compliance department, like compliance was a big deal, you know, since the, the uh, Reggie Bush sanctions and all that kind of stuff, compliance was running a lot of stuff. There's less need for compliance when all the NCAA rules get shot out of a cannon and said, those aren't legal anymore. Like the, the, if, if they try to appeal this ruling, it goes federal court, which, ends up at the Supreme Court, like, do you want them? Like, they crushed you the last time. What do you think is going to happen this time? Like, they can't really do it. The NCAA wasn't really happy about the ruling, but there's not a lot of recourse here. So I think when Jen Cohen was here, her thoughts were that this is going to get reined in and the sort of guardrails or the rules that the NCAA put out, they started to, like, I think they... They had some accusations against Oregon, Florida State, and Tennessee was the one that blew up in their face. And I think that a lot of people that were, there's schools out there that were like USC, they're sort of like following the what the letter of, you know, the intent of the NIL laws were or whatever, rules, um, felt that, okay, eventually this will get reined in and it, you won't be allowed to bring your collective on campus and meet the prospects and be this involved and all that stuff. And a lot of people felt that that was the way it was going to go. It went the opposite way. It was, it's very different than that. It was basically, and a lot of these schools were paying players before. So they had sort of the infrastructure in place. Once it became legal, uh, then they were ready to go. Um, I was impressed how fast, excuse me, collectives popped up. And I was like, I mean, the rule just happened. And like Texas A&M had this collective going. It was like people... I mean, they were ready for this. And, you know, USC really wasn't that ready for it. You know, they were just, they're behind. They're behind. They sort of extra followed the rules, got behind on that. I get, I mean, I can understand why you're doing that. But now, how does USC 
react. And talking to some sources, I think it's still, they're still figuring this out because it's sort of like, this was, you were following, it's, I don't know if this is a good analogy, but like if you're, you're, you join some cult and you have this like leader that you're following and it's just like, Hey, and there's people from the outside saying, don't follow that guy. That's not, no, no, he, he's going to like lead the way or she's going to lead the way. And then that guy, they, they go away. And now you're like, now you have no, like, what do we do? Our whole point was we were going to follow these rules because they were, this was the right thing to do. And maybe USC still thinks it's the right thing to do. But the rules are gone. The rules are Ill, like literally illegal. You can't enforce those rules. You can't impose those rules. And then it's sort of just like, well, we were being these great rule followers and the rules are gone. And so now what do we do? So I, I don't think, from what I've heard, that USC is like out there dropping bags uh, at you know, high school players. Um, they're still in the works of things. And though we're coming out of a dead period. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Yeah. Dead period, that's still a big rule. And that ends the last day is March 3rd. So coming out of that, will we see some different things happen and some more recruiting activity potentially? But who's to say? We'll see. Yeah. And I, I think one of the, the biggest aspect is USC, when you get, when you sign and you're enrolled, the collectives are very involved and USC does a good job, I think, with getting players paid. It's the, before that happens, they're not, they haven't been good. They're not, if a, if a recruit comes to campus for an official visit, for example, and we're going to get official visits this spring, USC hasn't had the collective involved in that where other schools have. Like, that's a difference. Like, other schools are saying, we're going to let the collective, you know, which are boosters and all that stuff be a part of this official visit and USC was not. So I'm told that that's something that is probably going to be happening now, but they're still kind of working on that stuff. But those are sort of the things where, you know, if Oregon is like, has division street, their collective, you know, former Nike executives, all that stuff involved in the recruiting process. I mean, that was one of the things that Tennessee did where they, you know, the collective and the coach and the prospect all kind of came together and the NCAA wants that separate and USC has been keeping that separate, but now you can make it, you could work. So I don't think USC has jumped in yet, but they're, they're still coming up with their plan of what they want to do. But for me, there's really no reason to not do everything that these other schools are doing because it's all legal. And if you're not doing it, it's a personal choice. It's like, that's, there might be schools that don't want to recruit that way. And if, if, if you don't, that's fine. But other schools will, and you're going to get an advantage by by doing that. I do think, too, the one other frustrating thing is talking about interpretations of the rules. There are people involved in NIL collectives at USC who meet with other collectives and other people at other schools and discuss their interpretations with them and have a lot of really good information. And those same people then meet with USC and I think if you if your USC had done a better job of listening to some of those people who they're committed to you but they do a nice job of getting information f from other collectives and here's what's going on in other schools can we try this and just I, I feel like when anything would ever be brought up it was like oh, the rules are going to change in the future we got to wait for that or no we're not going to do that yeah. we're not going to do that and I think that really hurt them and again I understand why they did it because of what's happened in the past but hindsight, of course, is twenty twenty, and looking back now, based on these court rulings, you have to say that was a mistake. Yeah, here's a comment from Traeger, uh, Trek, no, Trek Ranger. Sorry, <laughs> I'm saying that wrong. Sorry, it's been a long day. Uh, keep the NIL, but put a limit on how much you can pay a freshman some kind of salary scale. And <laughs> antitrust illegal. What you could do? Collective bargain. This is where it's going. We're going to, the, collect, the collectives will be part of the school, essentially. So why, why can the NFL have a salary cap? Because it's collectively they have collectively bargained that. So they're all employees. So you can't do that in this case. Um, it's free market. You have to just let them earn what they earn. If some freshman is, a, you know, phenom and has like 10 million Instagram followers, like, okay, uh, Bronny James, like, 
7 million Instagram followers. He can make a ton of money. You, you put a cap on that? Like, no, you can't do that. So what we're going to get to is players will be, this is going to happen in the next couple of years, probably. Like, every, this has changed a lot. So we're in these weird phases now. The schools will be paying the players directly. Like, that's going to happen. Some sort of, and, and I know, this opens up a whole different can of worms, but some sort of employment, maybe there's a breakaway. There's a lot of talk about a breakaway from the NCAA that, you know, even Charlie Baker, the president of the NCAA, you know, came up with this sort of uh, new division, super division thing where you would pay everybody 30 grand a year or half your student athletes, 30 grand a year. Something like that is going to happen where school, you know, you know collectives could just like donate money to the schools and the, the schools can pay the players. There's contracts. Could guys get cut and all that stuff? Yeah, maybe. I mean, all that kind of thing. But that'll be collectively bargained. I still think there's a lot of talk in the chat about becoming the NFL. Now, it, it's still going to be different. It's still going to be college, but there's so much money being made. It's like you can't, you, you had to, you, you're going to have to get there at some point. Like all these rules that you put in place, all the amateurism stuff is just gone. When you're making billions of dollars on TV, it's just hard to say you can't pay these players. Like you have to be able to pay them. And maybe in the future, you don't put waterfalls in the locker room and you don't pay a coach $11 million a year because you'd rather put some of that money towards players. Like, I think this could change a lot of things, but you might be cutting, like, coaches' salaries might not be as crazy as that. You might, maybe you don't pay $2.5 million to a defensive coordinator anymore. I don't know. Things are going to change. They're changing a lot. This has been the most like, impactful offseason we've seen. But this court case is like a huge, huge deal, just basically wiping out all the NIL rules. I do think eventually the cut of the network uh, that pay out to the conferences that trickles down to the schools, that eventually has to come to the players. So yeah, we've talked about a percentage it in the, of that. in the past, though, Ryan. Like, I love college football right now, even though it has some major, major flaws, but Viewership is up. The 12 team playoff, people are excited about that, even though it might go to 14 now in a couple of years. I don't know why they're talking about that. So dumb. And anyway, it just seems like, even for all of its faults, the sport is in a really good place. And if players do get paid, which I believe they should, does that change things for the, for the worst? And it, does that lead to people not being as bought in and caring as much? I don't think so, but I feel like there's a right way and a wrong way to go about it. And it could be cutthroat if if oh, there's yeah. a collective bargaining situation, like if you're in Nevada football, what are they collect collectively bargaining for? No one gives a crap about them. With all due respect, I I, I feel like y you start paying everyone, then you maybe split off Big Ten and SEC does their own thing, and you could add Florida State. Like I, I feel like that players getting paid to that uh, degree could lead to some real real changes where people might get turned off and. I, I would hate to see that. I don't have all the answers. I wonder if the NFL would ever get involved and, and start kind of treating the SEC and Big Ten and whoever else they add as like a minor league thing. But that kind of stinks. That The tradition just goes kaput. And, and already a lot of tradition has been lost with some of the realignment. So yeah. I, I do worry about people leaving because – Right now, it's so good, and it's sort of teetering, and, and I, I, I think it's trending in a direction where there's so many unknowns, it, it could lead to people leaving. I, I Like I've said before, I, I am so happy I'm not in a position to, to have to make those changes because it's really, really hard, and I think they run the risk of potentially ruining the sport if it isn't executed properly. Yeah, I mean, there's there's risk of that, and I think there's a lot of talk in the chat about that, but um, the, the sport does make a lot of money, mm -hmm. and... And people always will watch. You want the players to be involved in that. Like if you went to your favorite restaurant, do you not like it as much if you knew the waiter was getting paid well? Like, no, I mean, like you still like it. Like, I think <laughs> it's still, it's college football. Like you, and I think that was the NCAA's argument. And that was like a legal argument against it. Like, so you're not going to, you don't like the, your team anymore because the guy's now driving a nice car. Like you, you liked it better when he was a starving student and try, like, why like what what you know but what you said in the beginning is correct like the viewership is through the roof like the contracts i mean it is as as popular of a sport as it's ever been and you know it's behind the nfl but it's always been behind the nfl but it is 
very, very popular. And they're, we're seeing college athletics, even, you know, men's basketball. Yeah. It's been taking a hit. Uh, but guys are staying a little bit longer with NIL. Like there's fewer people that opted out for the NFL draft this year than in the last like five years. Like it's like half the, the normal amount. I think it was like 58 total um, guys up. So people are staying in college a little bit longer. That's a good point. And I think Dan Wetzel and you know co women's college basketball, holy cow, it's huge. Like Caitlin Clark is the biggest name in college basketball, men's or women's, you know, Juju Watkins is like, you know, she could potentially be there. So there's some really good things going on in college athletics. And I think Dan Wetzel made a really good point. Uh, you know, I, I like listening to him. Um, he's over at Yahoo. He was talking about in no other sport, like the sport, if you just look at it, it's like, it's at an all time high. Like everything's amazing as far as like, you know, viewership and you know interest and all of that. And they don't have to pay the players. And they don't pay, but there's more complaints about it. Like the, their own coaches are coming on. Everything sucks. Like this is terrible. Um, no, it doesn't. Like you would never say that about what, who says that about their industry. That's, that's, that's crushing it. Like college football is doing so great. Yes, things are changing and you can't do the, you know, our jobs are different than they were three years ago or 10 years ago. Or, uh, it's just different, but you kind of have to just adapt to it. And you get these coaches making millions and millions of dollars. Yeah, their lives kind of suck because they got so much stuff going on, but that's why you're making millions and millions of dollars. Like, why are you complaining about this when it's not like viewership is tanking? It's not like interest is tanking. People are really, really, really into the sport. So it's his point was it's just funny that you hear coaches bitch and moan about it when the sport is crushing it. No one's coming out and advocating saying, "Hey, the sport's crushing it." Like we are, like viewership's going crazy. Like people are into this. Michigan wins the national title. So many things going on. They're cool, and all you hear about is like, "Oh, coaches just want to leave for the NFL," and it's just it's kind of like this Eeyore doom and gloom thing. I mentioned that something before. It's because no one likes change. When stuff changes, then you get pissed. I fall into that all the time. But also, the coaches have to work harder, and that's why it's yeah. frustrating, too. They have to not only recruit high school players, they have to recruit the portal, they have to recruit their own you roster. You get paid a lot exactly. to do that. Exactly. exactly. A lot. So that's uh, the obvious response, and I, I agree with you, Ryan. That's 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 it right there. Yeah, so it's like when people complain, oh, I, I, you know, people are watching. Are they Are they tuning in knowing that, Caleb Williams apparently made $10 million over like, no, you still watch him. Like he's amazing. Um, and that's good. That's great. Yeah. I think there's a lot of good and it all comes down to, there isn't anyone that has the best interests of college football in charge. There are people that run their little fiefdoms. If you're Greg Sankey, if you're Tony Petiti, you're running, you want to do what's best for the Big Ten, mm -hmm. or you want to do what's best for the SEC, and the other conferences are trying to do what's best to keep themselves alive. You know, Washington State and Oregon State are scrambling like crazy to try to cobble some kind of conference together. Everyone's doing, looking out for themselves. The NFL and Roger Goodell gets a lot of grief. The guy makes like $40 million a year. It's like, we got one job, protect the shield. Like yep. they, they are the NFL comes first. We're going to make the calendar spread out as much as possible. We're going to control as much of the eyeball, you know, through, you know, we got the combine starting now. You got the draft, whatever it is, free agency that all this stuff is going on. And people are talking about the NFL. You have some guy that's the czar of the NFL of, of professional football in this country and that's his job. And all the owners that are under him, they you know they hired him, and they they want it's all in their best interest. We just don't because of the way college football sort of was born. It's like we, it's almost like the United States in general. Like we had a bunch of states. You know, there wasn't it wasn't England. It was you know we had a bunch of states, and Virginia had different you know laws and different views on things than Massachusetts did, and all that stuff. And it's just and we still see that stuff today. It would be great if something could come together and maybe when we have this kind of breakaway, uh, you know, and, and there is like a super league or whatever that we don't have like four commissioners, like it's, there's one, there's someone at the top that's leading all this that will make decisions that helps everybody. That's not just, we want Ohio state and Alabama to crush it. Like you want that, like the PAC 12 had leadership that was like, 
yeah, we want parity. We don't want USC to be good. Like the SEC was more about, okay, we want Alabama and Georgia to like go kick ass. But you also want like, hey, Nevada is an important part of this and, and Kansas State and uh, there's, people are passionate about college football, even though Connor said no. Like Kansas State, go to the Manhattan, Kansas. Like they love that stuff. Iowa State, whatever it is, there's a lot of that out there. Um, you know, go into an Iowa game or, or, you know, there's so much good that you need someone to kind of look out for everybody and while growing the sport. Like you're not inhibiting the superpowers from, you know, being great. Like Roger Goodell loves the Dallas Cowboys. It's, they're great for business. Even though they haven't won anything, people still follow them. And it's like, you got to make everything sort of work. And we don't have that in college football. And I think you're, you're seeing a lot of these problems we're having is because of that. And maybe we'll get it at some day. I've had a lot of rants today, Connor. Sorry. <laughs> no, it's okay. I, I just to, to respond to that, what you're saying, it sounds like you're arguing for like a minor league there because I think it's impossible for someone in charge, unless it is like a minor league setup, to, to really truly be in charge of just college football because the commissioners, of course, they care the most about football, but they have a responsibility to basketball teams and to all the other programs in their conferences. And then the school leaders, like Carol Fult, for example, she has a responsibility to help athletics, but she cares more about the school. And at the end of the day, these are all schools too. In the NFL example, all the owners, they don't have to worry about all these other students and all, you know, yeah. all these other issues. They just have to focus on football. And I don't know if we'll ever be in a position where the leader only can focus on football unless it's a minor league setup or maybe just the big 10 and the sec kind of go off and do their own thing. And it's just a totally separate entity because as long as it's intertwined with school, we're trending towards this crazy world where college football matters so much. And if my mom is listening. She'd be like, I don't give a crap about college football. These kids should be going to school. That's the most important thing. So yeah. this is all about school. It, it is separate. It's trending that way. And in order for someone to be in power and focus exclusively on football, I do think it would have to be totally separate and then that leads to some other problems. So I think they can do it without being like a, a minor league. Um, and maybe it's just the major sports is all kind of coming together. Um, you know, what's interesting is you mentioned, you know, these are college students still, <laughs> at least for now. Um, and people talk about maybe that not being the case going forward. But that might be where the NCAA has the most sort of leverage still. You know, there's nothing stopping... They got shot down. You can transfer, like, you know, you get sued if you, you know, so you could transfer as many times as you want. But the academic standing part of it, like, it, it's harder the more you transfer to be academically eligible. So I think that's kind of an aspect of it. The other thing coming up, too, is like, there'll be, there's been a lot of talk of, you know, eligibility, four years plus a red shirt. Well, someone can sue and say, you're, you know, I'm a really good college quarterback and I, I won't be a good NFL quarterback. I want to play in college for eight years and, and make NIL money. I hope they lose their suit if that happens. I don't like that either. I think that's one thing you want to keep with the sort of uh, collegiate calendar, you know, the academic kind of calendar. But, you know, I would be like, hey, you get five years to play five. Like just no red shirt, just play. You know, you're there for five years. That's fine. And then you got to move on. Um, something like that. But there's going to be fights over that kind of stuff too. But I think the tie in with college, the part of college athletics, uh, the fact that it's still tied to college, at least for now, I think that can like sort of be like what the NCAA leans on, on some of these arguments going forward. They're like, Hey, we don't want you playing for eight years. Like if you go to college for eight years, you're a doctor. Like we're not doing that. Right. So, <laughs> well, the problem is too, some NCAA rules are good. Like that rule. I, I, I think four in a red shirt is, is fine. I, I guess I could see it changing to five, no problem. But, like, I don't think anything more than five makes a whole lot of sense, even if it's in the best financial interest of a guy who's a good uh, college quarterback, yeah. not a professional quarterback. So I like that rule. There are some other rules I, I don't like as much. And I think the NCAA, it takes a ton of heat for, you know, the reasons are, are, are so obvious. People hate the NCAA. But there are some stuff that you need the NCAA for. Otherwise, it would truly be the – the wild, wild west, and the, that example right there comes to mind. I'm glad they have that rule of eligibility because if they didn't, you'd have 40-year-old guys playing college football, and, yeah. which I think happens every now and then, but I like that it's now and then, not all the time. Right. Um, 
Logan says Bo Nix played for seven years. <laughs> yeah, the, you know, uh, COVID and Jake Red Browning. Shirts, yeah. yeah, the COVID thing. Um, that I think that's the fact that it happened when it did, and now this is coming up. It's sort of like, well, we saw a guy play for six years and no one died. Like, let's not, like, you know, so there's going to be arguments for it. We just saw this, you know, happen. Um, so yeah, they, I, I, I'd rather, I'd rather it be like a five-year thing or, you know, I, it's fine. I'm fine with the red shirt or whatever, but, um, yeah, I don't want to see it go like six, seven years. I just, I just think then it's really not college. Like, you know, you're, you're not really going to school at that point. Right. So, um, yeah, the kid from Georgia, uh, who's the, uh, uh, Trek said, uh, the kid from Georgia played for six years and he never graduated. Yeah. Um, Stetson Bennett. Stetson Bennett. Yeah. Which is funny. Like, wow, that's a lot of school to not graduate. So, um, was he eligible? I'm not sure. All right. Why don't we do, uh, some questions? Let's see if you have anything else on that. No, I think that's a good ending spot. Thank you guys for putting up my rants there, but, uh, I have some opinions <laughs> on this whole stuff. I like, I like this kind of stuff. Uh, we got a text message from Mike. In Skidoo, California. No idea where that is, but that seems like a really freaking cool place. Um, (laughs) What is Solomon Tuyalapupu's status? Is he still with the team, and does he have any eligibility remaining? I don't know if his waiver has been officially granted or not, but he plans on coming back for a seventh season, and I checked in with Chris earlier. That's still the plan, he said. I think unless something happens unforeseen, he's going to be back. Yeah. Uh, that sounds cool. We'd love to see him contribute. You know, he's just like a team player. People, everyone loves him. Um, it'd be he, great he's to built see like a truck. He, he just has the guy who's always hurt. I, I feel so bad for guys like that who just, they look the part, they're talented and their body just lets them down. I covered him at the poly bowl. Like he came, you're, you're not supposed to come if you're injured, but like he was definitely injured. He had that foot injury in high school and, um, you know, thought he might play, never practiced, didn't do anything. He just, every time I see him, it just seems like there's an injury there. And it, like, this was the year, this, you know, 2023, or like, oh, yeah. And then what was his, what did he do? Like, it was right away. Like, tore his ACL. ACL, yeah, yeah. Right at the beginning, right? It was just like, ugh. Well, he got through spring camp and he tore it, I think, right either at the beginning or the middle of fall camp in the summer. Yeah. Terrible break. Because uh-huh. he, he was going to be on the two deep for sure. He was going to play. Yeah, I thought for sure. And then just, it was a crushing blow to the locker room because he was so popular and everyone was so excited that he came back yeah. and it didn't work. Swayze says, that was some good ranting. Thanks. <laughs> Appreciate that. Yeah, give us uh, give us your thoughts. Um, Frank in Sacramento, do you think USC will beat the odds and win more than seven and a half games as predicted by odds makers? So I don't, I haven't seen that number yet, but I think FanDuel might have put USC over under at seven and a half. Uh, apparently, I don't know. I haven't seen it yet. I've got to look. He says, outside of Penn State, Michigan, and Ohio State, the Big Ten is not as good as the Pac-12. USC has beaten their best over 30 times in the Rose Bowl alone. USC is 75, 30, and three against current Big Ten opponents. I'm going to plead the, plead the fifth on that because I need to see what the final roster looks like. Like, remember last year they added Barry Alexander in the second portal window, and he sort of changed the trajectory of the defense? Yes. I, I don't think that it makes sense to answer that question now. If I had to, I'd lean them being 8-4, and four, so I guess over. But I, I was over on their win total this past season, and that blew up in my face, so I, I'm scared to even make that prediction. I was over, too, but I think it feel better at 7.5, although... We drank the Kool-Aid, Ryan. We chugged that down. Oh, I did believe that the defense was going to be better. Me, too. I feel was, like a sucker. And it was it was not. Um, but I think the who's like in the Big Ten, who's had the best off season, like who Ohio State probably, and then second best Oregon, Oregon, and USC doesn't play either of those teams. That's true. They're they're the two top dogs. The uh, you know Michigan is they're going to be portal shopping heavy. They got a lot. They got dudes coming back, but they've lost a lot. Uh, there's a lot of Michigan guys that are at the combine. How come they didn't get one of the quarterbacks? And I feel like they weren't even mentioned. I don't know. Yeah, that's you know? kind of interesting. I'm not sure. Um, but they're going to be portal shoppers. So Michigan's probably going to improve uh, in this next window. And USC goes on the road and plays Michigan. But, I mean, there's a lot. If if USC gets its, you know, butt together, there's a lot. We talked about this last week. A lot of winnable games. So 
um, there's a lot of losable games. You're going to play a lot of solid teams. So if you're better than solid and you're, you're, you know, pretty darn good where USC could be, then, you know, they could do well. What do they look but, like on the line of scrimmage? That's my biggest question. Both sides, O yeah. line, D line, that those are in most seasons, the X factor, but I think for USC, especially because there's a lot of talent on the roster at other spots. I, I just go there because they haven't been great there the, the last couple of years and they have a lot of turnover. Yeah. You get pushed around and that wouldn't be, uh, that wouldn't be pleasant, but not playing Oregon and, and Ohio state this year. I think it's a, a pretty good factor. We had a comment in the chat from Kevin, more of a recruiting question, but are you surprised about the impact coach Henderson has had on the recruiting trail? He's been out of the college game for a while now. Based on everything I've read and talking to him, not surprised. He, he has a great recruiting pitch. And I wrote that USC is going to be in the game with a lot of these top 2025 and 2026 defensive linemen. And I think he's done that so far. Yeah. Now the next step, long way to go till December, but you got to sign one at least, but I, I'd like two or three high profile defensive linemen recruits. Then what I wrote, I think it was either earlier this month or January. Then I will feel even better about that because I mean, it's a step in the right direction being in the game, but we all know you got to seal the deal with some of these guys. Then you're really in the game. Yeah. We had another YouTube comment. Turnt Trojan, do you think we will finally be able to get a real spring game this year instead of the offense versus defense format? I don't anticipate Lincoln Riley making any changes. He, he seems set in his ways on that. We'll, we'll see. I haven't heard anything that would make me think they'll change it. I I see it being the offense against the defense again. Yeah, I would uh, always default to not changing when it comes to this stuff. Like, we still haven't received a full spring schedule, even though I was told, like, two months ago what it was going to be. I, I Yeah, I you know, we know the start date, and we know the, th and we know the end date. The end date, <laughs> and we know that they practice Tuesday, Thursday, Saturdays most of the time, which they're going to do did again. Did they practice Saturday last year? I don't remember them practicing They did, but Saturday. we weren't allowed to cover it. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah we yeah, weren't yeah. allowed to cover it. Um, so yeah, so maybe, you know, maybe Riley's tweaking some stuff, but for the most part, I think you just default to what it was before. So I think the spring game, I agree with you. It'll put until I hear otherwise, I think it's going to be, it would be fun though. Miller Moss against Jaden Maeva one-on-one. -on -one. That'd be cool. Yeah. I'd like to see that. Um, all right. We got one last one and we'll let everybody go from Logan, uh, with many fans move to Will many fans move to the NFL? Without the tradition, what do you have? You have the minor leagues. Baseball fans don't care about the minor leagues. Um, I, I think it's geography-based. Like in the South, no one really cares in Atlanta about the Falcons. Some people do, but it's more that's more of a college area. That's SEC country. That, that's college football. I think it'll always be oh. ge geographically. Is that... Am I missing the question? No, no. I think I think that's what kind of you say. But here's the thing: like, the Toledo Mudhens are very popular in the minor leagues, right? Like, people go. That's a very popular thing. The Dodgers fans don't care about the minor leagues, or the Yankees fans. Like, you hear about a trade and you're giving up prospects or something. You, college football, go to these individual places. There's a passion. If it doesn't matter what you said about the, I mean, do, the, the, the we talk about Kansas State, like if they're playing the Big Twelve or if they were in the Mountain West or they got pulled up to the SEC, whatever it is, like they're going to show up and cheer the hell out of those guys and really care about their football team. And so I think that's why this isn't. Yes, it's a lower division of football, but it's its own thing. You know, it's not the minor leagues of the NFL just because you're paying players. Like, the NFL isn't, isn't involved in that. Um, I know there's been talk of even like a college football draft, but that doesn't make – that. you know, I don't think that makes much sense. But the, you know, USC fans are USC football fans, and they're still going to have traditions of what's going on. The sport's going to change some. It just is. And now – if you felt really good that some player picked USC because they send a lot of guys to the NFL and they love their coach or, you know, whatever it is, and it's in LA, 
now a lot of times people are getting recruited because they got a good paycheck. You know, now some players are still like, hey, I want this, I want this tradition, blah, blah, blah. It's just changing, you know, the when you when money gets involved, things are going to change some. But I don't think it makes it the minor leagues just because people are getting paid because people care about Iowa football and they care about Florida State football. And just as much as Iowa, you know, as Ohio State or Alabama, like those are not minor league. Pro those are major, major programs just at a different, you know, a different level. These are college kids. These aren't the pros yet. So, yeah, maybe if you let kids stay around for eight years, then it would become the minor leagues. But just because you pay them, I don't see it being the minor leagues. It won't become the minor leagues unless the NFL gets involved and makes it the minor leagues. That's right. how I see it. But, in, yeah, then, I mean, then you would lose the, you know, I, I think people still are going to show up. And even if uh, they combine the Big Ten and the SEC and they're sort of Division One, and then everyone else is. I think the danger here is like you can't make it like the so let's pick the top thirty programs. Mm -hmm. You still have to have I don't know if you need one hundred thirty four, but you still have to have a lot because what happens in the NFL? Like people lose a lot of games. Like in college football, you're not used to losing a lot of games. If you're if you only had like say put the SEC and the Big Ten together and maybe add like Florida State and Clemson or something like. There's going to be teams that aren't used to losing a lot, losing a lot in those in those scenarios. So I think you still need to incorporate more teams than that. But I mean, if it's only 30 teams, then you're gonna it's gonna feel more like the NFL and minor leagues. But you know, Florida State a bad year is like you know USC goes seven and five, like that's a horrible year. But if you're in a 30 team league and they like drop like Purdue and and Vanderbilt and things like that. And there's only like good teams left. Someone's got to lose if you're only playing each other, you know? So I don't think we're going to get to there. That, that would be a lot tougher, but uh, I agree with you. We'll, we'll see though. There's a lot of stuff that needs to happen uh, along those lines. Uh, Swayze, do you think the first second division with relegation, like English premier league would work for college football? I just don't think it'll work for America in anything. I too much money on the line. I don't, I'm not a soccer fan. I am. But I love relegation. Yeah. Oh, my God. But the only reason it works for them is because of the history. There's no history of it here. And who would sign up to be relegated and lose all that money without yeah. any history? It, it just, that's never going to happen. Yeah. Like, the way, if it could work, it would sort of be a thing like, and I don't even know if the teams in the, you know, the halves would want this, but if you have your super league, say it was like a 48 team super league. And then you had like a 48 team, like second, like whatever the group of five sort of is that. And you said, okay, you're in the lower league and we're going to beat up on you. Sometimes we're going to, we need you for some games and stuff, but the best of you guys, four of you every year, this is like hunger game stuff. We're going to like, <laughs> like let you up. And then the problem is anyone that's starting in that 48, doesn't want the risk of going down below, you know, like what if like USC end up getting dropped down because they had a couple bad years or something. I think though, I don't think the haves would sign up for that, but the have nots are pretty have naughty right now. They've been that way. It's not like this isn't getting worse. I mean, I, I think the transfer portal has actually helped some of those schools. Like they get that third string tackle that Alabama wasn't playing. And then he starts for Nevada or whatever. But they would have an opportunity to kind of move up, you know. Um, I think that would be awesome to see. But like you said, like the money-wise, I think it wouldn't – it's like a whole different thing. I, I don't think people would sign up for it. No, that that's something that I can never see happening. But I love that. Yeah, it's, it is fun. I, there was a Brexit – was it the Brexit? Welcome to Brexit or was like Wrexham. a – Wrexham? Wrexham? Oh, something like a Brexit. Oh, Brexit's the other thing. Uh, welcome to Wrexham. It was like a – Netflix deal yeah. and uh, like Ryan Reynolds bought the team or him, him and somebody else. Right. Yeah. I, I was in, I think it was in Hawaii and I was talking to a guy from like the next town over, like their rival and, you know, talking about like, yeah, they're like three, four divisions down, like where they were and like what it took to kind of move up and how that all works and stuff and uh, how they love their, their club and, 
that stuff just really interesting. But there's a lot of history, and there's just like a lot. It's it would be like if you know Tufts was eventually trying to move <laughs> up to play USC at some and point. Jane Richardson know. transferred back. Yeah. So like Ryan Reynolds buys Tufts University and then like puts a lot of money into him and then they start moving up, make a documentary on that. But yeah, I'm not a soccer fan, but man, relegation. Yes. So fun. <laughs> Especially in my old age. Uh, all right. Well, I think that's gonna. So, you know, Swayze said Manchester City and other big names went through relegation. So they've, they've dropped down like the bigger brands have dropped down before. Well, they're not, they, they're not even a big brand. They are now that they got bought by a country, but they, they used to not be that big of a brand. Oh. We're getting into soccer here pretty big. Yeah, I don't want to do that. <laughs> stuff. Um, but, yeah, but like, so Man like Manchester United, like one I've heard of, like they've never been – have they ever been not, relegated? I don't think so, but like a, a Nottingham Forest is a big team that has a lot of history, and they've been relegated. Have you ever heard of them? Uh, no. How about like Liverpool or – I don't think Liverpool so anyone I've heard of been probably been. hasn't been relegated. Uh, maybe someone, but most of the big, big teams have never been. Okay. But they, yeah. So if that was happening, like, oh yeah, man, you or, or Manchester United like fell down and uh, came back up. They dropped down two divisions and then they won, but came, you know, but yeah. Like, you ever heard of Juventus? They got relegated because they got caught cheating. No. They're Juventus? like one of the biggest teams in Italy. Oh, okay. Interesting. Um, but yes, big fan of relegation. I don't, I don't know all about it, but just, it just, the concept is pretty freaking awesome. <laughs> so, all right. Well, why don't we wrap things up? Uh, end it with the soccer talk. I like it. Yeah. We're ending on the soccer talk, but we got, we did our complete breakdown of the incoming transfer class. Uh, if you don't agree with Connor, you can tweet him at C underscore Morissette. Please do. I love two it. S's. Yeah, two uh, two R's, R's two S's, yeah, two, two T's. I, I love some good off-season debating. So please. Uh, fun stuff. Okay. Um, Ryan's got some fish to catch. I got to catch some fish. <laughs> so we'll see. I'll, I'll, maybe I'll put some pictures up on the stuff. Uh, oh, Kevin said Liverpool was relegated in 1954. Oh, of course. All right. So not when I've been alive, and I've been alive a long time, way before I've been alive. Uh, all right, well, that's going to wrap things up for uh, Connor Morissette. I am Ryan Abraham. Hope you guys enjoyed the show, and uh, we will talk to you next time.